Hi, welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Arthur Benjamin. Arthur holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University and is a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College, where he has taught since 1989. He's a noted mathemagician, known for mesmerizing audiences by doing complicated computations in his head, even appearing on the Colbert Report. Today we'll be discussing his latest book, The Magic of Math, Solving for X and Figuring Out Why. It's not every day that we get to talk to a real math magician, so let's ask him five good questions. Welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Arthur Benjamin, author of The Magic of Math, Solving for X and Figuring Out Why. Hey, Art, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. It's great to be here. All right, Art, we're going to jump right in. Question number one, can you show us a couple of math magic tricks? Um, I was particularly impressed with one in the book where how wrong my intuition was for this uh, the two goalposts with a string tied between them problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So on an American football field, the... Um the distance between the goalposts is uh, 120 yards, 360 feet. And imagine we tied a rope from one goalpost to the other, and nice and taut, so exactly 360 feet of rope. And then we decide to add exactly one more foot of rope to give it a little bit of slack. Now, you walk into the middle of the football field and you, you, you raise the rope as high as it can go. And the question is, how high can that rope go? Is it high enough, um, you know, an inch high, a foot high, several feet high? How high can it go? And the surprising answer is that it actually can go about 14 feet high. That extra one foot of slack is gives you uh, gives you actually 14 extra feet in the middle, and to prove that you just need the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. And here's another consequence. I think about it, that, that I find equally unintuitive is if instead of lifting the rope high, you pulled the rope, you know, toward back, then that would mean that somebody who had to run from one goalpost to about 14 feet out in the middle and then back to the other goalpost is only running one extra foot than the person who runs from one goalpost straight to the next. Right. You, you, you can make a pretty good bet, a wager. Suppose you told somebody that you would do that path, they would do that path. Just give yourself like a five-foot head start, and everyone <laughs> would take the bet, yet you would have the shorter path. Yeah, you could say, I'm going to do like an arc, basically, of, of one extra foot, and uh, you give me a... Or actually, I mean, a 14 extra feet. Exactly. It looks like you're running a lot farther. I mean, even to the eye, it looks like you're taking farther. And yet, you, uh, the distance isn't all that different. It's amazing. That is amazing. And, and math is full of surprises like that, that, um, uh, that with just the very simplest of tools, we can understand why this magic works. Hey, here's another one that, I mean, that's, that's fun for your listeners to do right now. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was my introduction to algebra when I was a kid. Um, I want you to think of a number from 1 to 10. It could be any number, but keep it from 1 to 10 for this. And double that number. Okay? Now add 10 to that number. And now divide what you're thinking of by 2. Finally, subtract the number that you started with. And if my psychic abilities are working, you should now be thinking of the number five. I am thinking of the number five. <laughs> and, that's, and, and that's nothing more than the basics of algebra, which if I, if I were teaching an algebra class, uh, that's how I would start the first day. Because you want the children to say, how do you do that? Why is that true? Yeah, exactly. You know? and, um, and that's what I explain in my book, things like that. Yeah, no, and it was it's just chock full of those uh, interesting kind of brain teasers. And obviously, they get a little more advanced um, as, oh, as we move through. I mean, some of the stuff is uh, I was drawing back on, you know, my old days in school and thinking, wow, I forgot how much I actually knew about math back in the day. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm trying to cover all of the essential topics, the stuff that you know that you absolutely need. You know, your fundamentals of algebra, geometry, trigonometry, even calculus, but also the fun stuff that seems to get cut out of the curriculum these days because everyone's so focused on testing and making sure they have mastery of the basics. But the problem is, if you do that, you lose a lot of the the, the beautiful material, the stuff that makes you say, "Wow, this is really pretty cool." You know, yeah. some people can learn how to solve the quadratic equation after a couple examples. They don't need 20 examples and if you give them 20 examples you may have the opposite of the effect you want. Sure, maybe they can solve the problems, but they're not going to be happy about it. They're not going to feel good. They're not going to be enjoying their mathematics experience. Yeah. You know, it would be as if you asked a music class to spend all their time copying notes. And maybe if you're going to be a music copy editor, you would need that sort of skill. But instead, let them listen to the music, experience it, have fun with it. And that's yeah. what I'm trying to do with mathematics. That's great. Um, so question number two, Warren Buffett very famously has no calculator on his desk. And he's supposed to be very sharp with numbers in his head. Sure. For those of us who are less gifted, um, what are some tips or tricks that you have for being a little bit better mental math uh, calculators. Okay. Well, here here's a simple piece of advice that, um, I mean, I'll give you two pieces of advice. One is when you do the math in your head, uh, it's better to work from left to right. And that's the opposite of how you might do it on paper. On paper, we're taught to do things from right to left, right? You, know, you start with the ones digit, then the tens, the hundreds, the thousands, and so on. But that's backwards, right? It, it's, um, we read numbers left to right. We pronounce numbers left to right. We should calculate left to right. And the numbers on the left are more important than the numbers on the right anyway. Better to know that your answer is around 3,000 and something than to know that it ends in seven. Yeah. Right, so with um, by by working left to right, you get a better sense of 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 the important part of the number. Um, but but here's a specific tip. Um, suppose uh, suppose someone said, "I've got a ten-digit number divided by a four-digit number. How big is the answer?" Now they don't tell you that in school. They don't tell you that you know if the answer is six, six digits, ten minus four is six, or maybe one more, maybe seven. If if the ten-digit number starts with a digit that's bigger than the four-digit digit. digit leading digit, then it's one more. But, but that's it. It's, you subtract or, or add one. Um, same with multiplication. If I have a four-digit number times a six-digit number, how big is the answer? Answer, it's ten digits or one smaller. It could be nine digits if the leading digits are pretty small. Anyway, with that, um, that that's a very... Uh, that's more important to know the magnitude of your answer than what the first digit of your answer is, or certainly more than what the last digit of your answer is. Yeah, Warren Buffett has a great quote on that. Uh, and it's, it's, I don't need to know that you're 397.5 pounds to know that you're fat. I mean, that's like <laughs> what his, his joke is. It's better to be, you know, approximately right than precisely wrong. I agree. Yeah. So question number three, what makes the number nine such a magical number? Gosh, when I was a kid, I thought nine was the most magical number. Um, here, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll, I'll give you a magic trick based on that, okay? So um, I want you and your listeners to think of a number, let's say between 20 and 100, okay? Some number between 20 and 99, okay? Think of the number. And now I want you to add the digits of your number together. All right, so if you were thinking of 47, 4 plus 7 is 11. Now I want you to take that total and subtract it from your original number. Okay. okay. That's the hard part. <laughs> All right. So if you had 47, 4 plus 7 is 11, you would subtract the 11 from 47. Okay, now you're thinking of it probably a two-digit number that you didn't even know you were going to be thinking about. And I want you to take that two-digit number and add those digits together. Okay? Got it. Now you should have a one-digit number. And again, if by the <laughs> power vested in the number nine, you should have the number nine at this point. And I do have the number nine. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Um, now, now what, what's it based on? It's, it's literally based on the fact that we work in base 10, and 9 is one smaller than that. And, and because of that, you know, there's good mathematical reasons for it, it's going to have this nice property. For example, um, if you look at all the multiples of 9, 
9, 18, 27, 36, and you add their digits, you always get 9. Well, okay, when the numbers get bigger, like 99, the digits can add up to 18 or 27, but they're always going to add to a multiple of 9. And that's really the basis for that magic. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. All right, so question number four. Here's another one out of the book that I was shocked to read. And then once I started thinking about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But a, a, a very well-shuffled deck of cards is likely unique in the entire universe. Can you explain what's going on there? So when we're counting the number of ways of doing things, that number can grow really, really quickly. So for example, if I were to shuffle a de deck of, if I wanted to ask how many ways can a deck of cards be arranged, you have 52 choices for the first card. And then once you've chosen it, you have 51 choices for the next card. Now, already the number of possibilities just for the first two cards is 52 times 51, which is 2,652. If you take the third card, there are 50 choices for that. And now you've got 52 times 51 times 50, as Warren Buffett would say, a little over 150 cubed, 125,000. Uh -huh. And if you look at if you look at the number of ways you can arrange that entire deck of cards, 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, all the way down to one, you get a number that's called 52 factorial. And the number of ways of doing that is, I, I don't remember the number, it might be around 10 to the 80th power, the 50th power. It's some gigantic number yeah. that's approximately the size of the number of atoms in the universe. And so the chances are that if you, if you and everyone on Earth just started shuffling cards every minute of their lives, chances are all of the, that, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 if you shuffle your deck right now just once, chances are nobody else on Earth, if they, do, if they all shuffle their decks, will get the same ordering you do. And even if they shuffle for years and years, they're not going to get the order that you do. There are just that many. It would be it would be like two people, you know, um, choosing the same grain of sand, and and uh, yeah, ten times in a row, something, yeah. Yeah, something, something that crazy, unlikely. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. It is. It is. <clears throat> I mean, we, th we can sometimes think of the, um, the astronomically large, like the number of stars in the sky, but we sometimes have trouble understanding the, uh, the infinitesimally small, things that are just so improbable uh, that they're virtually never likely to happen or repeat themselves. Yeah. So question number four, um, some people use the, the Fibonacci analysis or sequence for stock price and trend analysis yeah um it is interesting that it pops up so often in nature um and that you know markets are really nature in human interaction do you think that there's anything going on there uh is there anything to that we should be interested in there from uh like, are we missing something by not knowing more about this <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm a big lover of the Fibonacci numbers. I am, in fact, the secretary of the Fibonacci Association. A, uh, so we're talking to the guy who would know. If someone, you know <laughs> I've written dozens of ma mathematical research papers on the Fibonacci numbers and on all the beautiful, so many beautiful number patterns that they possess. And people find lots of interesting applications of the Fibonacci numbers. They do seem to show up in nature a lot. The number of petals on a flower is often a Fibonacci number. The number of spirals on a pine cone or a sunflower is often a Fibonacci number. And yet, I'm going to pour a little bit of cold water on what you just said. There are sometimes people get a little bit carried away with Fibonacci numbers. And it's definitely true. There, there are people out there who are, uh, who are using Fibonacci numbers and the golden ratio uh -huh. um, in making stock price predictions. 
but I'm not sure there's any hard evidence that it works. I mean, I'm people, I, and you could say, well, I made a fortune using it. Well, yes, but there are probably people who lost a fortune using it who aren't talking to us. Yes. You know, so um, uh, be a little bit careful when hearing thing when hearing numbers used sometimes for purposes that they weren't intended for. I mean, sometimes people see anytime they see a number that looks like 1.6 and they say, aha, there's the golden ratio at, at work, you know. Yes. Uh, it's the most beautiful rectangle. It's the most it's the ratio from the head to toe to belly button to toe. You know, and it's just not when scrutinized, often necessarily true. So I love numbers and I love all that they can do for us, especially the Fibonacci numbers, but be a little bit careful when um, when anyone proposes a get rich scheme. Yeah, I think that's a good advice. I mean, it, uh, I was just I was curious more if there was any theoretical, you know, anything at play. But, but uh, I, 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 I mean, I, it's a it's a total long shot for sure. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, I, when you search the word Fibonacci numbers on Google or something, you will, you know, you either see math references or you see financial, you know, yeah. uh, Fibonacci methods for picking stock prices and when do you buy and when do you sell. Exactly. And um, uh, I, I've asked around from those in the know, for example, the editor of the Fibonacci Quarterly, which is a strange title for a journal because it comes out four times a year. And one, two, <laughs> three, and five are Fibonacci numbers, but not four. So something's going wrong. But even the editor himself says he hasn't seen any evidence that shows that it works. Yeah. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. So our, our, one of the things that we always ask for is a book recommendation. And uh, we're usually looking for something that's, you know, maybe a little under the radar. Um, mm -hmm. What do you have for us today? Well, I, let me give an author recommendation because okay. the, the mathematician, the original mathematician, the, the greatest of the 20th century, was a fellow by the name of Martin Gardner. And Martin Gardner wrote hundreds of books, literally, on, and many of which were on mathematical topics, scientific topics, skepticism topics. Martin Gardner would have cautioned you to, about using <laughs> Fibonacci numbers for picking stock prices. But, um, uh, but I, I, I take after him in so many ways. Uh, I mean, he, he wrote for, 20, he wrote for uh, 25 years a column in Scientific American Math magazine called Mathematical Games. And, and all of his columns have been uh, serialized into books with names like Mathematical Carnival, Mathematical Magic Show. Um, my, my favorite first recommendation, especially for, um, uh, to get a kid excited about, uh, about recreational mathematics was he, he had a couple of books with names like aha and gotcha and on each page there would be a problem an intriguing problem that anyone could understand you wouldn't need any kind of advanced mathematics to to understand it and be interested in it then on the opposite page he shows using very simple mathematical reasoning the solution to the problem. So th th those would be my recommendations. Um, books called like Aha Insight and Aha Gotcha. Hey, that's perfect recommendation. I love those kind of things. Hey, Art, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. My pleasure. All right, take care. Bye-bye.